So here we are in Grand Hotel on Thomas Francis Marquis in Waterford City. Um, and we look really at the history and development of the city of Waterford. The military aspect of it is quite important. Waterford was a garrison town, or garrison city. We had two barracks here. We had an infantry and a cavalry barracks. It was an important military feature in the town. And the city of Waterford has been fought over and disputed on four separate occasions. There's four battles or conflicts which are commonly referred to as the sieges of Waterford or the siege of Waterford. The first one was the Norman conquest or invasion in 1170. Uh, uh, I suppose a pivotal moment in Irish history. It marked the beginning of the end of the power of the Irish tribes and then it marked the start of the Norman conquest or invasion into Ireland. Then we had the Siege of Waterford in 1495. A gentleman called Perkin Warbrick, he was a pretender to the English throne. I was actually the successful uh, withstanding of that siege led to the city being granted the motto Orbs Intacta Mane Waterfordia, which means Waterford remains the untaken city. Then we had Oliver Cromwell's attack in 1649. In the winter of 1649, the Cromwellian troops were camped on the, across the river on the Ferrybank side, and they laid siege to the city. Bad weather, the winter months, disease uh, led to Oliver Cromwell breaking off the siege, and Waterford could lay claim to being the only place that wasn't taken by Oliver Cromwell. Unfortunately, uh, Oliver Cromwell's son-in-law, Henry Ayrton, returned the next summer and finished what Cromwell had started. The recent uh, siege, or the most recent battle for Waterford, was in the Irish Civil War in July 1922. That actually directly involved this building. Anti-treaty or irregular IRA troops held this side of the river, and free state or pro-treaty troops were on the other side of the river. And the anti-treaty troops actually had a plan to demolish or blow all the significant buildings on the quay, such as the Munster Express office, the Granville Hotel where we are today, the General Post Office and Reginald's Tower. And luckily enough, that plan never came to fruition. They were surprised when the Free State troops managed to cross the river down below and they, kind of, they flanked them. Um, when the Free State troops got into the city, the anti-treaty IRA withdrew, and that was the last known conflict here in the city of Waterford, but did leave uh, some casualties and also quite some significant damage to the buildings along the quayfront. That all took place in 1922. So even recently enough, we can see there was a kind of a military aspect to the city of Waterford. The area we're standing in today is what's colloquially known nowadays as the Viking Triangle. This is the original part of the city, founded by the Vikings in 914. Without going into too much ancient history of the city of Waterford, it is worth noting really, I suppose, some of the, the, the salient points as to why the Vikings settled here and what they saw as the importance of the location of Waterford City. Even the name of the city of Waterford gives an idea as to why the Vikings wanted to settle here. Waterford comes from the Norse or Viking word Vadra Fjord, which means winter harbour or safe harbour. Basically, the city of Waterford lies in a valley. We have high ground on either side, and that means it's very sheltered, very protected for shipping. Another key feature as to why the Vikings wanted to settle here is three very big rivers drain into Waterford Harbour, the Nore, the Shore and the Barrow. Between them, these three rivers drain or access one-fifth of Ireland's landmass. If you control access to Waterford Harbour, you control access to one-fifth of the landmass of Ireland. This is medieval times, there was no road system. We're talking about everything happened by boat, either externally around the country or internally up to the river system. The Vikings knew all this. That's one of the reasons, or some of the reasons, why they wanted to settle here. Good for trade, good for commerce, and also militarily a very strategic location. This is a Scotch key area of Waterford City's uh, harbour and port. Uh, in its time, a vibrant part of the port. And one interesting feature of the development or the importance of the port to Waterford was the presence all along the quayfront of our commonly known, or known back then as consuls. And basically these were the representatives of foreign governments based here in the city of Waterford. They're like small embassies. And it really gives an idea, or gives you an idea of the importance of the city of Waterford. When we start to look back to the records and look at who was here representing the different countries. We have people like Robert Jacob. Jacob was the famous uh, biscuit makers here on Bridge Street in Waterford. Robert J Jacob was actually a consul, a representative of the government of America based here in the city. Uh, we have people like Simon Newport. Simon Newport was mayor of the city. He was also consul representative for Sweden, Norway and Denmark here. Uh, we have other kind of well-known names like James Graves. Graves were just up behind us here and there are timber merchants. And James Graves re re represented Denmark, Belgium and um, France. Uh, we had Richard Farrell here later on, also representing the United States or the Americas as they were known at the time. What do these people do? Consular agents were basically like representatives and what they looked after was the interests of the countries. So for instance, uh, if a ship came to port and there was a problem, say there was a shipwreck, sailors had gone missing or need to be rescued, 
the council representative for that country was responsible for the welfare of those uh, nationality of those sailors. They also looked after trade missions. If you wanted to inquire about purchasing a large degree of stock from somewhere like Belgium, France or Russia, first person you call would be consular representative. Um, how did the system work? Some countries paid their representatives a small fee, whereas the Americas, when they started, the American country had no real money and no access to funds. They recently split from the British Empire. What they did is they let their consular agents charge a commission. And this kind of novel way, they actually spread their consular representation all through the known world in quite a short period of time. But really, like I said, it's a mark of how important Waterford was that you could walk along the quay and call into a representative of the Tsar of Russia, the, the, uh, the German king, uh, the emperors of France. They all had a representative based here in the city. These were all prominent Waterford, rich, wealthy businessmen, but they also I suppose Moonlighters are also worked as a second job representing these foreign countries. That's definitely a mark of how important the city and the Port Waterford was at that time. So here we are in the Waterford room of the Waterford City and County Library. And really, when we look at the history and development of the city of Waterford, you can't overemphasise how important the history of shipping and the port has been to the city. Um, one way that anyone can get a, an idea or get a handle on how important and how busy the port of Waterford was, was come into the library here and look up some of the old newspapers. We randomly picked the week, February 1863. Uh, the publication was the Waterford News, the newspaper of the time. The Waterford News went into great detail listing the shipping that was both arriving and leaving the city. The shipping was of huge importance to the people in the city and the merchants and the business classes of the city. I was always keenly followed what was happening in the shipping news. Uh, for that particular week, the, the, the Waterford News lists a ship called the Porsche, which was arriving uh, from Portugal with general cargo. Uh, courier ships from Dublin and Liverpool, a ship called the Demshane, which was coming from Lagos, again with General Cargo, a ship called the Ida, arrived from London, a ship called the Malakoff, with a, a, actually a Dutch master, a Russian ship, came all the way from the Crimea with a cargo of maize. We also had passenger ships leaving the city. We had passenger ships from Warford going to Bristol, Liverpool, Plymouth. We also had the newspaper advertised passage or fares for transatlantic trade. People could buy a ticket in Walford, go to Dublin or Belfast, meet a ship and sail as passenger to Boston, New York. Uh, that particular week we also had a list of ships, over 10 ships left the city of Walford. A lot of them were kind of uh, regular enough ports in, in Liverpool and, and uh, Britain. Some of them were transatlantic. There was a ship left that week bound for Boston. Um, the, the, port, the newspaper also carried detailed report of the sinking of a ship or a missing ship called the City of Glasgow, uh, which had strong connections here to the City of Waterford. So we can see the shipping news and the, 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 I suppose the interest in shipping was huge in Waterford City. And just that one page in the newspaper covers ads for transatlantic trade, it covers arrivals, it covers departures, really gives you a good idea of how important and how busy the port of the City of Waterford was. Like I said, all these newspapers are available to the general public. It's just a question of coming into the, the, the Warford room and here in the city and county library.